Save it here. Don't know where we are. Uh, bridge. Right. I've just been having a play with a patch I've found for the sound. Just gonna see what happens. Maybe nothing. You have been a thorn the in my side. Sound doesn't work at all now. Also wasn't showing up the game. Ah, that's because I've got two DOS boxes running. Back to the drawing board. Right, I've tried what I can and I can't bloody get the music to work. So just sounds so terrible. There is no escape from this prison. So I'm pretty sure that pulling that one, that one, or that one is going to be bad. Not as bad as that. upon you thief what I only wanted your body I don't want you for your mind to attack me yeah what the fuck what have I done to you fuck off Adventurous friend or traveler's friend, or whatever they were called. Chest save. That's why we save.
fine. Your treasured Britannia succumbs easily. Soon, all the land will be mine. Yeah, I'm sure it will. Hello? The fuck? A trap house. So it's in the void. The fuck lives in the void? Corgan's Fang. Well, that. Just tell whoever it belongs to that I've got it. stairs then it's wood oh hello mythology of the Zealand deities Throughout the ages, there are people who have looked beyond themselves to find the answers that were any issues of life. Do we know that the Titans, master of the four elements, control our destinies and direct many forces that affect our lives? However, such was not always the case. Our zeal and forebears know not only the power of the Titans, know not the power of the Titans. Instead, they worship the common emotions. Not realising that feelings are popular sensations experienced by all people, the Zealands elevated the three primary emotions. Love, hate, and apathy to the ranks of deities. The goddess of love, they name Amorous, giving her the power of natural nurturing happiness. The one called Odeon, the Zeons attributed the emotions of hate and grief, giving him the role of warrior and protector. Stand between them, our ancestors assigned the role of arbiter and balanced their apathas, the ruler of indifference. Even though the texts indicate the Zealands initially believed not in three but six deities, in addition to the rules of love, hate, and apathy, uh, Felicita controlled joy, Dolores ruled grief, and Timuria was the patron of fear. Though anthropomorphic in nature, some of them had animalistic features such as Dolores and his thorax head. Through time, however, the Zealands found it difficult and inconvenient to pay homage to so many gods and goddesses, so they elected to combine this space into three. Confusing aspects of the Zealand gods served to display a fickle nature of our ancestors' beliefs. Zealands believe that while days ruled the emotions, they were also subject to them. More Zealands who experienced a particular feeling, the stronger that day's power grew. Conversely, discarded emotions, however, temporary meant weakening deity, forcing some to enter near catatonic states, till they gained enough followers to re-emerge. Thus, an improbable cycle took place. Odeon planted the seed of hate within one of his subjects, and as that seed grew and took root in another warriors, Odeon became more powerful, spreading the hatred further. The most Zealands believe they are contact with their gods through their thoughts and emotions when the priests and select few were allowed to speak directly to them Zealand's constructed great mountainside temples housing gaudy shrines to the three or six patrons several labyrinths were excavated and filled with deadly traps secret passages were made for the priests to enter while a few Zealand's who dared seek audience with the gods were forced to overcome the fires of the dungeons many died trying few succeeded once before the Zealand deities worshippers still had to present one of the ancient seals before getting permission to speak. These seals were round shields of wrought metal embossed into a triad of sections. One depicting a reddish scimitar, another showing an open palm displaying a heart. Third revealing an image of balanced scales. Having passed through the test and the great shines and offered the appropriate icon, Zealand follower would then be allowed to pray for a boon from one of the gods. Regardless of whether the believers he did, considerable sacrifice of animals and valuables required. 
Rarely did these athletes to any benefit, though some stories claim that the legendary Kumash Gore first conferred with his patrons before he was able to unify the warring tribe. There's much to be learned. Did I say warning? Unify the warring tribes. Much to be learned from studying the mythology of the past, although we know today that the powers of the Titans are, unlike the deities of our forebears, quite real. We can learn a lot about violent and emotional personalities of our ancestors. In sorcerous ways. Sorcery is the magic of fire. Destruction is the sorcerer's ball. Baliwick? Baliwick? Being first and foremost an adept thergist of the Order of Enlightenment, I find it hard to reconcile this power with my training as a healer. However, were it not for the Cabal's efforts, Ireland would have been long long since perished beneath the ash and lava pouring from the volcano. Some of my acolytes feel that having this power gives us an elevated status. I cannot agree. Our power gives us the ability to fill a duty to our people, no more, no less. Pentacle is the first instrument we used. Uh, we of the Cabal used uh, in dealing with the Lord of Flame contain a, and bind him if properly prepared and administered fire throws Ugh. fire flows first through a medium of pentacle before being shaped by the sorcerer Ugh. the lines of the pentacle serve different purposes in the web of the enchantment the outer ring called the peripheron is a barrier or ward if you will that allows the sorcerer to conjure with safety Lines of the interior divide into two groups, the conducia that touch points of the uh, peripheron and the inner pentagon are called the locus. Points where the conducia touch uh, peripheron each have a designation that relates to their distance from the volcano. The farthest point is called the philion, the middle uh, mesostele. Mesostel pa sits to the right of a philion, while mesostel z sits to the left. Final points closer to the volcano are probably named Perivolcane. Perivolcanum part is on the right, and Z is on the left. The candle. Basically, for these candles in sorcery is merely to aid in focusing the sorcerer's will upon the proper enchantment. Black candle incorporates ash with wax to temper the will with order, while red candles use blood and wax to free the sorcerer's imagination. Reagent, the relevance that reagents have to spell are twofold. They provide essential energies to the sorcerer's use as well as assisting in formation of the proper spell. Their portions and proximity due to the candles around the uh, peripheral and extremely important and not to be tampered with. Experimentation is only to be attempted in the presence of full complement of assisting acolytes. The focus. The focus in thergy is a purified icon of, of the spell that the thergist concentrates on to reach its inner power. Not so in sorcery. Focus is merely a receptacle of power. Great amounts of energy are spent to attune a spell to a focus and empower it. Once it is infused, only a minor exertion of willpower unleashes the charge of the spell. Depending on the size, makeup, and configuration of the focus, as well as the energy of the caster, a number of these charges will be available upon a successful binding. <sighs> Complicated. Yeah. And ceremonial shield. Need that at some point. Then I'm gonna kiss. Final sunlight. Read that. <coughs> so then I may forget the origin of the necromatic order. I, Gallius, do now put pen to paper, and here I record the acts of Morians the Necromancer. By the time the Necromancer, the Titans wreaked havoc upon the world as was their wont. People suffered and many were killed in the hands of the immortal Titans. The most terrible and powerful of all the Titans was Lithos, the Titan of Earth, called the Mountain King. Lithos shook the world and destroyed all that was built. He ripped up on the ground, and into his maw the people did tumble and satisfy the Mountain King's hunger. People lived in darkness and were afraid of the Titans, therefore none dared to confront them. And one day, a very brave and wise man named Morians came forth. Why does the Mountain King kill our people? No one could answer Morians' question. No, no one could answer Morians' question, so Morians sought out the Mountain King to find out why he did lose his lose his wrath upon the land. Long did Morians seek the mighty Titan, did finally meet the Lord of the Earth in the Hall of the Mountain King. 
there in the Mountain King's Hall did Lithos, the Lord of the Netherworld, tell Morians of the people's failure to properly worship the greatest of all titans. And Lithos commanded Morians to return to the surface world, and from that day on, Morians was to offer up the dead to Lithos, so that the Mountain King might be served as befits a might titan. Morians returned to the surface world and carried Lithos' message to the people. Since that day, the people of the world may choose to worship whichever titan they so desire, or they live upon the surface of the world. Yet, yeah, when they enter the grave, all become Lithos subjects for the rest of eternity. Some people accepted Lithos' command, and the Earth Titan did cause cease to ravage the land, and the people who did live upon his back. The Mountain King did make Morians his necromancer, and thus did teach Morians the magic and the power of the necromancer. Long did the wise and brave Morians serve Lithos, but, as is the way for the mortals, all mortals, Morians did grow old and sick, and that he too must enter the grave and join his lord in the netherworld, Morians consulted Lithos and who should follow him as the necromancer. Lord of the Earth did instruct his servant to find a suitable and worthy person to follow Morians' path and become Morians' successor when Morians did die, thereby did Gallius of Tenebrae become the first Sion in the necromatic line. On Morians death, Mark King chose to reward Morians for his service, Lithos taught the necromancer the ceremony of eternity by which the necromancer would be allowed passage into the Hall of Eternity and sit at the right hand of the Titan and counsel his eternal lord. Then Morians did return to the surface for the last time. He did teach the ceremony of eternity and I did turn, send him to the Mountain King. This is to be done and written by my hand upon my day of confirmation by Lithos. Lord of the Netherworld, the Mountain King, Knights of all Titans, Gallius of Tenebrae, and Necromancer. Reagents of Thermaturgy. Uh, it doesn't actually tell you what the reagents are. Right, moving on. So I've said there's no other material special to go past. One reason I feel this way is that it gleams and shines like sun that rises to reach us every morn. However, it's not the only reason we value gold so much. Indeed, there are several reasons other than its beauty that makes it worthy of praise. Malleability, conduct of being resistance, corrosion are among the chief reasons we adore this metal. One very reliable method of extracting the soil from the land is mining, which requires the digging of long, often deep and dangerous shafts in the land, it's often accompanied by the use of explosives, to ease the difficulties associated with the removal process. Another method, although not as high yielding as mining, but much safer, is panning. Panning is done with shallow pan requires more than anything patience. Many of the air areas, streams and brooks around which gold nuggets and dust uh, abound with gold nuggets and dust and by filling the pan with silt and washing the silt from the pan one will find only the heaviest objects left in generic gentile graces of amaras those heaviest of objects will turn out to be gold the process is time consuming but relaxing and profitable gold is enjoyed a popular that no other mineral ever has and most likely continues to be highly valuable besides being the basis for our monetary system it can be found in jewelry and sculpture and used for filling decaying teeth and even everyday plaques I've read that one. The Reagents of Thermaturgy. I read that one, it didn't tell me anything. Chronicle of Pagan, which for some reason I can't get at. There we go. Was letting the world more refreshing to me than knowledge. I remember my youth hearing tales of legendary times and explored places, fantastic beasts. Constantly pressed my parents with instructions with endless number of questions. How's this work? Why that? Blah, 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 blah. I've read that. Where's the one I'm looking for? Ah, here we go. The Objective History of Pagan by Mithran. That's the guy we're here to see. Ages ago, in what's called the First Epoch, there was considerably more land upon which mankind could walk. 
The Zealands, forebears to the pagans, worshipped three who ruled the emotions. Amoras, beautiful and spirited, was the goddess of love and joy. A counterpart was angry Odeon, ruler of war, hate and grief. Between them stood Apathas, who controlled indifference, representing both the balance and the absence of the two comrades. According to legend, these three gods and goddesses were responsible for bringing the emotions to light in their followers. Though sometimes I think it was people's emotions that resulted in the appearance of these ancient ones, as they are now called. Although the Zealands were not known for valuing peace between their various tribes, one leader did step forward to unite them for some time. He was known as Kumash Gore, considered a great warrior. He brought his people together by conquering most of the other tribes and then integrating them into his own. A unified community grew, prospered under his rule, until he was assassinated several decades into his reign. After the death of Kumash Gore, the Zealands fell again into quarreling tribes, however, not until the coming of the Titans was their culture ever truly threatened. Many centuries after the call of Kumash Gore, a strange entity known only as the Guardian began to speak to the minds of several of the people. First, those who claimed to hear the unusual, unusual voice were ridiculed. When the message began to foretell danger, others found reason to listen. Words of warning from the mysterious Guardian came such as a shock to the Zealands and to the Ancient Ones. No one had ever heard of a champion of evil called the Destroyer. Nowhere, nowhere were they certain of his designs upon the world. However, few people who learned of the Destroyer spread their message quickly. They constructed the Great Temple and the Black Obelisk, while the Ancient Ones commanded those who still obeyed the way to wage war against this new religion. Followers of the new order became known as Pagans. As they were directed, they began to concentrate their worship through the Black Obelisk, choosing the very elements of earth, water, air and fire as the objects of this worship. Soon the elements began to form into actual beings of tremendous power. When the Destroyer finally appeared, the four beings, the four titans as we call them today, rose up to fight it. During the terrible battle, the world was ravaged and the skies darkened overhead. Lands were torn apart by earthquakes and liquid fire and the seas overcame by raging storms. The battle was long, but the titans emerged victorious. The Destroyer was no more, however the world still lay in ruin. Few people who remained gathered on this isle, which they named after the island's volcano, Morgalin. Uh... It was a... what? It was a something time. The Titans began to fight among themselves for power. Wars between the few surviving Zealands and the Pagans continued. It was apparent that something had to be done. Yet the question of what filled everyone's mind. After the defeat of the Destroyer, the people were faced with a great many problems. Wars between the Pagans and the Zealands were costing many lives, while the bickering Titans seemed almost worse than the Destroyer that they had so mightily uh, eliminated. Foremost on the minds of the pagans was how to handle the titans. No simple task, I assure you. None they could not best the four, nor wanting to, since they considered the titans their saviours. The elders elected instead to bargain with the elementals. They built four areas and made them sacred to each titan, one for each. A man named Morians went to the Hall of the Mountain King, the Sanctuary of Lithos. He spoke with Lithos and begged for the quakes to end. Lithos agreed, but demanded that he exchange a boon. He received a boon in exchange. He begged that the people would give to him upon their deaths to serve him eternally in the pit of death. The idea of burial was first introduced as a means for people to be conveyed to Lithos. Both sides accepted the path, with Morians granted the magical powers necessary to only the pagan half of the bargain. But as Mor Morians began to feel the effects of ageing, another pact was formed, whereby Morians could pass on his abilities to subsequent necromancers, a term given to the mages responsible for sending the dead to Lithos. Much time passed before Hydros could be placated, Hero and necromancer Caelan found love with his apprentice, yet the lurker displeased that, unlike her brother Titan Lithos, she had not the worship of the people, chose to take from Caelan his beloved. The angry Caelan sought the assistance of his patron, who was quite willing to assist in vengeance. Lithos told of a substance called Black Rock, which could be used to seal Hydros within her temple, but Hydros could not use her waves to wear down this mineral. Using his necromantic powers, Caelan reshaped the black rock around the temple, trapped Hydros inside. Preparing to use the substance to completely remove all traces of water around the Titan, Caelan was stopped by the lurker's pleas. In exchange for her life, Hydros agrees to return the body of Caelan's betrothed and confer some of the powers of tempestry, magic of storms and water, upon Caelan and all of his descendants. In addition, often the Titan, she would end the torrential rains. Trapped even still in the defiled temple of the flowing waters, Hydros remains appeased. More years passed, and a wise man named Stelos was contacted by Stratos, Titus of Air, 
in the form of a mystic voice. She gave him the power to heal the sick and wounded. Caelan learned of Stellos abilities and visited the elderly man, brought with him the hopes of returning life to his beloved. Stellos spoke with Stratos and was told that much time had passed since the spirit was with the body, and at great cost could she be reactive. Could she be resurrected? A giving man, Stellos agreed to pay the unknown fee. He sent his spirit deep into the realm of air and saw many unusual things. Finally, as the wizard man came upon great wizened man that came upon great brilliance his body's mouth opened on the ground below what his body's mouth opened on the ground below breathed life that makes no sense his body's mouth opened on the ground below breathed life into Kalen's beloved he returned to his material form to only learn that he forever lost his villain his vision. God, why can't I fucking talk? So thankful was Caelan that he called upon the ground to form the foundation for a building which still has opened as a place of study for those who wish to learn the tenets of air. In addition, Stratos granted one further boon to the kind and gentle Stellos as immortality. To this day, Stellos aids and teaches the magic of Thurgy upon the formation at Argent Rock Isle. Centuries after the great miracle of Stellos, five Thurgis sought to quell the raging fires of Pyros. Time to fire. They took their knowledge of history, never forget the value of studying the past, my friend, and speculated that black rock might be used against Pyros as well as Hydros. Set about gathering as much of the dark material that they could as well as collecting knowledge about the magics necessary to ship it. Drawing a pentagram on the ground, the five began to call Lord of Flame as ready to offer a sacrifice. When Pyros appeared, however, they instead used a large chunk of black rock to bind him within. Trapped within the fragment, Pyros was unable to hurl fire from the great volcano and to this day must perform the minor request of those who possess the black rock. I'm saddened to say that sorcerers, as they are now called, are misunderstood and feared, nay loathed by most pagans. Considering the dangerous task performed by their predecessors, it is a pity that such people we hated are the effects of ignorance. That was long.